It's always messy uh, when there's anything at stake, um, when there are real costs to be paid in the process. Working it out, a portrait of the New Jersey legislature, next on Caucus New Jersey. Anyone here think he's a racist? I will use the word racist. Can you help in this direction, Mrs. Yes, you certainly help. Are you afraid? Of course I'm afraid. I'm afraid every time I step outside. During the mid-1980s, I spent two of the most rewarding years of my life right here at the state capitol serving in the legislature. During that time, I came to realize that very few people really understood about legislators or the legislature. You know, the process of making laws, of making public policy, can be challenging, but also very complicated. So in producing this documentary, we thought one of the most useful things we could do was to help you, the average citizen, better understand what legislators actually do. In order to do that, we received the help of two very distinguished representatives, Republican Assemblyman Richard Bagger and Democratic Senator Gordon McGinnis, who graciously allowed our cameras to follow them while they went about the process of working it out. I've always been driven in this process towards seeing things that I can change, that I know I can accomplish and, uh, and make better. I like the process of legislation. I love that process. I like the policy stuff. I like the constituent service. I view one of my roles as a legislator as quality control. And to make sure what we're doing, we're doing right. I love solving puzzles. That's what I get to do as a senator. It's great. And I get satisfaction from seeing that every once in a while it actually works. People get help. People get into college. People, you know, I mean, something happens. I much prefer getting drawn to, you know, is there a tax question or is there a... Uh, uh, a, a legal question or a regulatory question that needs to be fixed. I know I can fix it and get it done and look back six months later and say, you know, these are the things I did, uh, as opposed to you know, just having a, a robust debate about the great questions of the day. This system's too big, it's too complicated, it's, it's too impersonal. It needs to have people who can, who can represent the interests of individuals and to work your way through the the, the maze of regulation, of uh, laziness, of, uh, of uh, bureaucrat, you know, everything that's put up in the path of people. This, this, this having senator as your first name calls attention to a question. It doesn't resolve it favorably always, but you always, almost always are assured of an answer. For Rich Bagger and Gordon McGinnis, a typical day in Trenton involves dealing with staff, lobbyists, and legislative committees. Sharon Harrington is a lobbyist with long experience in the state capitol. What I feel I do is broker information. That means that I take the information I'm provided by my client or a business or um, a particular interest area and bring that to the attention of a legislator or someone in the administration. Yeah, I'm very knowledgeable about the electric side, but know uh, very little about the telecommunications side. Well, telecommunications side. is like an afterthought. Right. You know, as long as we're doing it, let's throw telecommunications in. The misconception is that the Telecommunications Act of 1996 created competition, the federal legislature. Right. It didn't. And this was proposed by the Governor's Task Force on Lenox City Access and Circulation. This is what they recommended at this point. How important is big money down here? Big, special interest lobbying money. How influential is it down here? I don't think it has undue influence on the process that takes place. It creates an, 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 an appearance uh, problem about, about faith in, in legislative uh, democracy and representative government that uh, uh, would be good to, uh, good to address. You see the influence of money in what doesn't happen frequently. The bill that never gets posted, the bill that gets sent to the wrong committee, the bill that gets uh, through the committee but is never voted on by the full Senate. What about those committee meetings? They seem to go on forever. Right. They can be terribly boring. Sometimes it's boring, rarely for me, if you're a member of the minority. Uh, this is the only place where you can have consistent influence. You work with your colleagues on a committee a lot. You get used to one another. There's a good respect back and forth. Most legislation we consider isn't partisan. So this is a place where you can have some real influence. 
Mr. Chairman, I think the uh, important aspect of this legislation is creating the fund and the, and the mechanism for incentive payments uh, for voluntary K-12 regionalization and, and sharing of services. This morning I presented a bill uh, to the Education uh, Committee uh, to promote voluntary regionalization of schools. Uh, typical example, I think, of the, of the legislative committee process working well in that the committee chair and some of the members of the committee saw the need for an amendment to, to protect the intent of what I was so trying great. to do. A change. A change to the bill. Well, I asked him to amend it today in committee because one principle that I think is very important is that bills should leave the committee in the shape that they need to be to become law. Not only to amend them here by the whole assembly if something comes up later. So it was an example of the, 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 the system working and the committee process does, uh, does work well. So working it out, be it in that committee meeting or on the floor or whatever, right. That's a big part of your job here, a big part of this process. But isn't that sort of what the rest of us have to do in our lives, whether we're politicians or not? That's exactly right. And, and more people watching the legislative process from outside should keep that in mind. I mean, that our, our legislative system, like real life, puts a real value on compromise, coming together, and, and getting something done. Some people who view the legislative process from outside want to see the slugfest between one side of an issue and the other and wants to see who's standing at the end of the day. It, in almost all circumstances, it's more productive to share ideas, negotiate, and come up with something that is the closest to a consensus uh, for the people of the state. I make a real effort to work with people on the other side. Uh, I get along with people, typically. Uh, I'm interested in, I'm serious about the work. Uh, I think that's appreciated and respected. It's not political for me. It's, I'm, I'm interested in, in, uh, in uh, getting better bills through or stopping bad bills, and, and I try and take things on on the merits. Can you please take your seats so we can get started? Rich Bagger has one advantage over Gordon McGinnis. He's in the majority party that controls the Assembly and the Senate, and Bagger is the chair of the Republican Caucus a position that gives him significant influence. The party caucus uh, is an opportunity uh, for the, uh, the members of each party to discuss both the agenda for a particular day's legislative activity, but then also the overall agenda for the, the legislative term uh, in an informal, uh, closed doors uh, kind of way. But most what it presents an opportunity to do is to solve problems and answer questions. What happens if now my running mate, he's going to be building a house and moving, they get all his furniture on that truck and then they say, well, Mr. Bateman, uh, we found it took more time and we want an additional $1,000. Uh, what do you do in a case like that? Well, Walter, well, you bring up a good point because that's exactly the way the law is now. As a bill sponsor or someone who's been asked by uh, the, the legislative leadership to, to, to resolve a complex issue. You need to look at the perspectives of all interested groups and determine which are really the legitimate concerns that need to be addressed and which are perhaps concerns that are just being articulated that aren't, aren't critical. And understand it well enough uh, substantively to figure out how to build uh, common ground. Are there any uh, consent bills that anyone would like to uh, discuss? There's you know, some uh, you know, informal uh, uh, banging of the table, but it's mostly the hard work of get answering people's questions and, and figuring out how to uh, develop a consensus broad enough to advance a legislative agenda. But not all legislation is created equal. In this session of the legislature, a bill to change the way schools are funded took center stage. And both Bagger and McGinnis had problems with Governor Whitman's prescription for change. Talk about world-class education. I support the idea of core curriculum. I support the idea of having the highest standards. I do not support taking those school districts, which now provide the most concrete examples of how a world-class yeah. education is provided, and those school districts. 
I think what the commissioner has proposed is a uh, very intriguing and thoughtful attempt to uh, change the constitutional uh, debate about the constitutional guarantee of, of a thorough and efficient education in New Jersey away from the strict uh, super equity requirement uh, that the uh, uh, special needs districts be funded at the level of the highest spending districts in the state, a, a constitutional mandate that uh, was almost uh, guaranteed to uh, result in uh, the same sort of uh, leveling down that we're concerned, uh, concerned about today. Senator McInnes, would you support a tax increase to bring the special needs districts up? That's to up to you? the governor. She's, she's the one who cut the budget and reduced the cash flow by $1.2 billion. There were three votes on that. I voted against each tax cut three times. I'm one of four legislators who did that. And I think that it's, I think that that was, that was, that was a short-sighted, politically driven, and reckless, fiscally reckless step to take. Mr. Bagger, Mr. Bagger, would you, Bagger, would you support tax? a tax increase to uh, later? No, I would not. How, how, how would you oppose that? Yeah. I think that the, the approach that the governor has taken to try to uh, define what is a thorough and efficient education is the right approach. If it has not been done adequately and not has been priced out adequately, then we need to get about uh, doing that. But I uh, fundamentally disagree with the notion that the Constitution uh, requires a super equity between the uh, high spending districts and the special needs districts. Assemblyman, in a setting like this, is, is, it, is it awkward for you to be in a situation like this where you came here to say certain things and listen, as you said, but then you're, you're put on the spot? On the tax question. Well, it's not, I don't find that difficult at all. Uh, what's difficult about a setting like this is coming to a uh, session where there's expected to be a lot of uh, uh, criticism of the administration of my own party. And I came here today uh, to demonstrate that while I uh, support the overall framework of what the governor has done, there are some legitimate questions that have been raised that we need to deal with in the legislature on a, on a, on a bipartisan basis. And yes, sometimes that is uh, tiptoeing a little bit on the high wire. Okay, we're off and running. Back in their home districts, Rich Bagger and Gordon McGinnis find that school funding is on the minds of many constituents. Yes, ma'am. How do you propose a better education for their children in school? If teachers are being laid off, and yet there's an increase of the students going to school. Right. Uh, I don't think... In the end, you can do it. If it keeps going like that, you're not going to be able to provide as good an education as you can if you maintain smaller class sizes. I go to all these things. Uh, I enjoy them. You know, I like to teach. I think, a lot of, I think a lot about politics is teaching. My wife says I do too much of it, entirely too much of it. People who work with me say the same thing. But I, uh, I, I, I like the opportunity. Why don't we have any say so and say to them, you put that money back in the general fund and drop our taxes. We paid for it. You know what's important is that legislators don't do legislation. That's not what most of my colleagues, you know, spend time on particularly. Uh, they are elected officials who happen to be legislators. And I think the emphasis is much more on what they do as elected officials in terms of the informal stuff and the legislation is not a burning interest of a, of a lot of people who are in the legislature. I believe that. Uh, so there are a lot of things that is where your job is informational. You're, a, you're an ambassador from state government in a way. You're explaining what the law is. You're explaining what the policy is. You're explaining what the administration's doing. The real challenge of being a uh, legislator is, is taking the information that we receive in our constituencies from meeting with people, from walking down the street and, and, and talking to people, from just running across people in day-to-day -day life, taking those concerns and those viewpoints and being able to translate that into activity in the sometimes arcane world of how the legislature works in Trenton, and then on, on the same time, translate the ar sometimes arcane activity of what goes on at the State House and be able to come home 
and describe it and explain why it's happening. Sounds like a pretty good plan. Well, there are three prongs that I would apply to a test to evaluate that plan. The first test is the economic development test. What's in my time in the legislature, I've had about 50 Jersey economy and bills that I've sponsored as the principal sponsor that have become law. And probably uh, a dozen of those, maybe more, are bills that someone came into my office and said, you know, there ought to be a law. All right, I have a problem. Maybe you can help me solve it. The law it favors the insurance companies. Yeah, but isn't it up to you people to make sure that things like that don't happen? Well, we're trying. I'll tell you what my, I have a bill to change it, okay? And it's a good bill, and it's passed the Senate. Mm -hmm. Everything that is important in my legislative role goes on in this office in one fashion or another. This is the uh, uh, sort of the nerve center. It's not a huge operation. We've got three people who work more or less full time and some people who work part time and a large number of interns and volunteers. All right, do you have any phone things that I got to worry about? No, not right at the moment. All right. Okay, thank you. This is where we do our homework uh, in preparing legislation. Uh, this is where we uh, uh, address the problems of constituents. The company is bankrupt right now. It's not a Superfund site, but there's a lot of cleanup that needs to be done there. It's a 23-acre parcel, and they've well, gonna, If it's not a Superfund site, who's going to do it? They've, uh, the company has submitted a remediation plan to DEP. And but, you know, mainly this is a, I, I like to think of it as a help center for uh, the 25th Legislative District. Good afternoon, Senator McInnes' office. Well, he should be my contact, since he's no, in he, UMDNJ. Well, that, that's, <laughs> he wants somebody higher than him. I have a legislative staff of two full-time uh, staff people and someone who works half-time who uh, handle correspondence and the telephone inquiries. Uh, I receive about a thousand inquiries a month from constituents. Just so you know, I've been encouraging the governor's office to get it to us as soon as possible. It's going to be too late for your situation, but we'll see what we can do. It might be too late in my situation, but somebody else gets exactly. it. Maybe it'll help somebody else. Exactly. Well, that's what we're going to try and do. Every time I think about it, I go by that fence down there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. Thank you, Wally. Nice to see you. It's a seven-day-a-week schedule. You're she's gonna, she's gonna talk to you and make a copy of that, okay? Somebody asked me about my schedule the other day, and I took out my pocket calendar and I went through it. And I said, look, I was, I've been out at events uh, 19 of the last 21 nights. Thank you very much. Thanks, for coming. My pleasure. I typically will attend uh, somewhere between 25 and 30 events of some kind a week. I think it's going to, to work out. Uh, I'll start the day with an early morning meeting uh, with constituents or representatives of some organization. And then after an early morning uh, breakfast meeting, we'll go to my business office for most of the day and then uh, return uh, here to my legislative office for about an hour at the end of the day to go through the day's mail. And often on a weekday evening, uh, there's a meeting or sometimes two or a community event or two in the evening to attend. For these two legislators, there's never enough time to get things done. But for the legislature itself, a court order deadline required that the school funding issue be resolved by the last legislative session of 1996. The governor had agreed to changes in the bill suggested by Rich Bagger and other Republicans. And as expected, many Democrats clearly were not happy. The process itself is sometimes extremely disappointing. Uh, it is sometimes much too hurried. Uh, sometimes uh, it lives up to that old saying, there are two things you should never see being made, laws and sausages. Ladies and gentlemen, the House are ready to start the voting session now. I believe this bill was crafted to get the governor and the legislature through November 1997. And that was the goal. The goal was not increased educational opportunity for our kids. It wasn't 
to find a more equitable taxation system. We had a goal, and the goal was November of 97. You have uh, a lot of individuals around the table. You have a lot of constituent concerns, a lot of lobbying groups. Um, when they get hold of a piece of legislation, at the end of the day, it's never the same as when it started. Um, and it is somewhat of a hodgepodge in the sense that you have different ideas, different patchwork being put in. But I think at the end of the process, by and large, you have a piece of legislation that is far much better and serves the greater good at the end as opposed to in the beginning. This is a devilishly complex issue. We've been handed a tough one. The court did not ask for a plan of the legislative majority. It asked for a plan from the entire legislature. But that is not what we've gotten. I sit on the Appropriations Committee. Uh, we waited five, six hours for the majority group to come back, and uh, we had nothing to do with the decisions that were made at the last minute. Here's the message to the property taxpayer. The state is backing away from providing support for all the things that your school district now does and must continue to do in the future. There I think that most of the Democrats here do school. represent the urban areas, but we happen to also represent the minority party and the major decisions are not left up to us. We, we just complain <laughs> most of the time. It's always messy uh, when there's anything at stake, um, when there are real costs to be paid in the process. I think there's no question in, in, on this school funding debate that the public debate that has taken place in the newspapers, uh, on the airwaves, and in uh, communities all across the state, at PTO meetings and Board of Education meetings and in people's uh, living rooms, has been shaped by the, de the debate between the two parties. It is a, uh, a process that is uh, designed to get a majority vote of people who represent different parts of the state and represent very different interests, and that you have to find a common platform for that majority before you can get it. The working it out in the legislature to get to what people say around here, 41, 21, and 1, 41 members of the assembly, 21 senators, and one governor to, to support something, you have uh, a lot of dynamics, but it has been mostly a dynamic within the majority party. Look, this is a tough business for most people who are in it. Uh, it has a much greater element of surprise. Uh, you know, a single sentence in response to a reporter can create enormous difficulty, maybe lose an election for somebody. People expect a lot of you. They expect you to show up. They expect you to be available, accessible. They expect you to be pleasant and, and fun all the time, right? Uh, it's tough. It's physically grueling. So there's a little bond that's created for those who are in the business. And that bond is, uh, it, it should be uh, one that leads to a respect for the fact that we're all practitioners, good practitioners, I hope, at trying to make this uh, representative government work. All here say aye. All opposed nay. Motion passes. One final note. Soon after we completed this documentary, the New Jersey State Supreme Court declared the school funding law unconstitutional. The court mandated that the governor and the legislature come up with a new plan to put more money into urban schools like this one in Newark. The process of working it out continues. I'm Steve Adubato.
If you would like more information or if you're an educator interested in using this program as a teaching tool in your classroom, write to us at Caucus, New Jersey, P.O. Box 242, Bloomfield, New Jersey, 07003. Our email address is talkcaucus at aol.com. And visit us on the World Wide Web at www.caucusnj.org. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, Rutgers Newark, NJN, the New Jersey Channel, and 13 WNET. This special edition of Caucus New Jersey has been made possible in part by contributors to the Eagleton Institute of Politics, Chuck Itayan Roast. Major funding has been provided by Beneficial Management Corporation of PPAC New Jersey, a subsidiary of Delaware-based Beneficial Corporation, a consumer finance services holding company. Additional funding has been provided by PNC Bank. New Jersey Carpenters Apprentice Training and Educational Fund, New Jersey Association of Realtors, Pfizer, Laborers Local 472, Communications Workers of America, Local 1034, Shearing Plow, and Bees Public Spirited Corporations. Promotional support provided by the Daily Record, Morris County's newspaper.